At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Hello and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. And today I have my very first returning guest. One of the very first people I ever talked with on the podcast, Dennis McKenna. He's now back in the studio on the West Coast and he's here to tell us about what he's been up to in the last two years and particularly to get us up to speed with this uh, new conference he's hosting in the UK later this summer in May. So welcome again, Dennis. Well, thank you, Dr. Nutt. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Appreciate the invitation. Good to be speaking to you. So, yeah, so tell us about uh, five years since the last conference and uh, what's the, what have you got planned this time? Okay, well, the last conference was the uh, 2017. It was ESPD 50. So ESPD we is short for Ethnopharmacologic Search for Psychoactive Drugs. And that event was the 50th commemoration of the first ESPD conference, which was, well, 1967, happened in San Francisco, sponsored by the National Institute of Mental Health. And all the leading lights in the field, and there weren't that many in those days, were there, Richard uh, Schultes and Andy Weil and Alex Shulgin, many of the figures that are now legendary were there. And the only thing, it was a totally private conference. The only thing that the public ever got from it, the taxpayers, which wrote, paid for it, was this book, you know, the symposium volume, which uh, was available from U.S. government printing office for years, went out of print. Somehow or other, that book fell into my hands at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And I read it from cover to cover, and I was very excited because it made me see that there was actually science behind this big word, ethnopharmacology, you know, and that and it was very inspiring to me. Well, the government intended originally to have follow-up conferences every 10 years or so. That never happened. The war on drugs came along and they became embarrassed they'd never been associated with it. I was going to say, that's right. They haven't <laughs> been promoting the first volume, I'm sure. <laughs> Not exactly, although it's been selling well or it had sold well. You know, U.S. Public Health Service publication number 1645. I don't think it's in print anymore. But so in 2017, 50 years later, I'm still at it, and everything came together in terms of a venue, interest, people available, and so on. So we did that conference. That conference we published. you did in Britain? We did. Yeah. We did it at Tyringham Hall. And why did you choose Britain? Because the venue, the uh, venue came up. I, thanks to Anton Bilton, right. who you probably know. Very well. Very well. Yeah. He made his place available to us, and it was exactly the kind of venue I wanted. I wanted it to be an elegant, lovely place, and it certainly was. So that plus, you know, people's willingness to underwrite it, help fund it, and great people helping organize it, some of whom are working on this one. So we just did it, you know, and then we recorded all the videos, and those are still up there. We live streamed the event. Sometimes during the four days, 75,000 people were watching this thing. So that was really gratifying, you know. Many, many more people know what ethnopharmacology means now. So, you know, and then we published this lovely double volume set. We published the 1967 conference, reprinted because it's public domain, right? tax paid for it. 
and the 2017 conference. So we published those as a box set. They've been selling well. And in the spirit of the whole enterprise, you know, we decided, you know, the government may not have followed up, but we're going to follow up. So this is our follow up. This is our five year follow up on the 2017 conference or the 55th year after the first one. So here we are. And you're coming back to the UK again. You, yes. You got addicted to us. <laughs> different place. So we found a different place. I think what you found is equally beautiful from the, from the oh, I think so. the website. Yeah, and possibly a bit larger, if you can believe it, than Tyringham Hall. And that's good because we have more guests and we have more, you know, we have more speakers and it's all together a much a much bigger affair in some ways. More more speakers. And I think it's going to be a very interesting program. We're, we're getting, we're kind of getting away from the original idea, which was purely more or less focused on ethnobotany, ethnopharmacology, looking for obscure psychoactive drugs in places that you would never really normally look for. Well, we're going to do some of that, but we've got couple of other forums now that we've tacked on to this that I think are appropriate. One of them is the policy forum in which you're participating. And Carrie Turnbull is going to talk about the corporatization of uh, psychedelics and, you know, some of the ethical and other pitfalls with that. Timely, timely. And yeah, yeah so, so we have that going. Then we have another forum on the destigmatization of coca, which is really kind of out in left field. I mean, there's nothing unknown about coca, but it has a very important cultural role. And, you know, you're a person familiar with what happens to drugs when they're stigmatized. Well, coca has been stigmatized for centuries, really. And, and it's it's undeserved. Coca is a very beneficial medicine when it's used as a medicine, as a as a food and in the herbal form. Cocaine, I can't say much good about it. I mean, I guess it has its uses, you know, but its association with the international uh, drug cartels has kind of besmirched its uh, reputation. But so coca is a very useful plant. And culturally central. So we're going to do a forum on that, getting Andy Weil and Wade Davis are going to talk and a couple of other people will be there. Uh, Cody Swift, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, come across Cody. Yeah. So that, that will be an interesting forum. And then we have another forum that's a dedicated forum for young investigators. Yes, I saw that. That looks exciting. Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think, and you know, we're, we're trying to be inclusive here. And so bringing young investigators, giving them a spot in, in the sun, so to speak, is good because we're going to talk about the need essentially for academia to step up and fund ethnobotany. You know, it's more important now than it ever has been because this knowledge is being lost and the habitats yeah, and right. the, you know the genetics that the plants themselves are threatened so like all of these things it's a complex interdisciplinary kind of thing with many moving parts but so we're going to do that and then we have all the other more ethnopharmacology focused topics you know so i'm very excited i think this is going to be a better the other conference was great. This is going to be greater. Well, I'm sure you're right. I mean, the thing is, the field has exploded. The last conference was in some ways a bit of a, you sort of lit the touch paper, didn't you? And I think, I mean, Compass Pathway didn't exist before, and now it's doing clinical trials, and there are 40 other companies or so doing clinical trials just with psilocybin. So you, you've really initiated an explosion, at least of commercial interest, and, and I think scientific interest too, to be fair. Well, I don't, I don't think our conference had much to do with that. But I think that, yeah, in the five years since the last conference, it's, it's a totally changed landscape. And that's good. That's, finally, you know, the psychedelics are being uh, recognized for their promise. You know, 
and you've had a lot to do with that. Your re colleagues in the UK have been leading the charge and various people in North America. And so, you know, it's about time we talked about this. Now, this conference, this ESPD 55, is not exclusively focused on psychedelics. You know, we're casting a broad net. We've got, you know, some interesting, besides those forums, we've got some interesting, you know, topics. Where we have one gentleman who's a marine biologist who's been looking at different tryptamine derivatives in uh, sea sponges. And so, and another, another presentation about psychedelic, the use of animals as psychedelics. Uh, investigator from Italy, we haven't gotten their abstract yet. I'm a little concerned, but anyway, we'll, we'll hope for the best. She sounds like she has a very interesting- So this is the toad. Talk. Is this the toad or is it beyond the toad? Uh, it, <laughs> it's the toad and other things. The toad and it's the toad and other. Th apparently, there are many things that are used as psychedelics in the animal kingdom. And the toad. I don't know if you just saw the article yesterday. I think it was in the New York Times about the the Bufo alvarius, the source of 5 methoxy DMT. Yeah, that's what I was. Uh, yeah. 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 That I'm sure she'll talk about that. Sorry, what were the New York, what was the New York Times saying about that? I guess it's it must be important if it's got in the New York Times because that actually was one of the uh, it was the triggering of Silas Sybin once he started talking about our work in Pollen's book, and then suddenly things opened up for the for the mushroom. So maybe the same. but we want to put too much pressure on the toad because they're an endangered species, I think, aren't they? Well, yes, they are an endangered species, and that's a problem. Even though they can be supposedly sustainably harvested. You don't have to kill the toad to obtain the venom, but it does put stress on them and they are being over harvested. And the irony, and I think what's you know sad is in some ways, 5-methoxy DMT is a very common compound in plants. You know, I mean, there are many plant sources of 5-methoxy DMT that could be substituted for this. And, you know, the, the article was interesting because there are some people that are promoting that, you know, the use of this toad has some kind of history in traditional medicine and the tribes in Mexico that supposedly used it, but actually that's just hype. That's not the case. There's really no evidence that there was a tradition of use of, of these toads, at least not in that way, but people that are you know, promoting it doing their own, you know, their own promotion and having retreats and so on with this stuff. You know, it's always good if you could link it back to some sacred, revered tradition. Just total, excuse the term, BS. Really? I had, that's already something I've learned. So how, do, how, how did it get discovered then? I can't, who discovered the... It came out of, out of science. John Daly, who was a famous uh, toxicologist at NIH. Yeah. <laughs> He was there when I was there, when I went to NIH in 86. Yes, he was working on bufetanine or something, wasn't he? One of the other toads. He was working on a lot of toad venoms and other amphibious toxins. He's the guy that uh, did the work on the arrow poison frogs, right? You know, that are not psychedelics, but they're extremely toxic, mostly channel blockers and that kind of thing. So he did that work. He did the work on the bufos and show that this one species, apparently uh, out of all of them, has 5-methoxy instead of bufotenine. It has bufotenine too, but it's 5-methoxy. So John Daly, you know, published that work. And, right. He was there in 86. I was there in 86, as a matter of fact. Were you? I was, ah. yeah, I, I was doing a postdoc actually at NIMH working on serotonin receptors, doing uh, autoradiography, using uh, iodinated DOI as a ligand to map these 5-HT2A receptors. This was my brief foray into actual neuroscience. I'm basically a botany, a plant guy, but I had the chance to do were this. You, in building, you weren't in Building 10 with me, were you? 
I was. I was, <laughs> yes. I was in the Laboratory of Clinical Pharmacology with, what was his name? Potter. Bill Potter. Bill. Bill Potter. And I worked for Juan Saavedra. Did you know Juan Saavedra? Yes, he was my supervisor. Yes. Yeah. Argentinian fellow. The reason I ended up working for him was that he and Axelrod, Julius Axelrod, had worked like a decade previously on endogenous DMT, and they're the ones that showed that DMT occurred endogenously, and they published that. So I went there excited, thinking that, well, I'm going to work on DMT, or I'm going to work on ayahuasca or something, because because the way it came about is I had sent uh, Dr. Saavedra my paper on, uh, on ayahuasca, which I just completed a couple of years before, and he requested the paper. Remember, back in those days, you didn't do it. You had to send a postcard. Yes. They would, <laughs> they would send you the actual hard copy. It was none of this electronic stuff. And so he requested this paper, and I recognized his name from this work on DMT. So I enclosed a letter, which was essentially something about, you know, thank you for asking for my paper. I'm aware of your work and would you, any possibility that you could take me on. I'd like to work on, on this endogenous tryptamine thing. And he wrote back a very nice letter and said, well, you know, my lab isn't really doing that right now, but we're doing autoradiography. And he said, I would love to sponsor you for this fellowship. So I ended up getting this two-year fellowship, going to the lab and working with Dr. Saavedra. But it had at that point, we'd left natural products aside. We were working with this synthetic DOI, which with the help of uh, Alex Shulgin, working at the uh, Lawrence Livermore lab at the time, we were able to get a labeled we got each enantiomer of the molecule labeled with iodine-125, and I was able to use that in my research. And it was great fun. It was... <laughs> if I'd known that, we should have talked, because I was I was giving people MCPP, thinking I was stimulating a, a 2C receptor, but maybe I was stimulating a 2A receptor as well. And it was certainly quite interesting, the very fascinating variations in the effects of MCPP in humans. It's... Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to sort the 2A and the 2C receptor. I mean, this was why why DOI was so interesting, because it was so highly selective yeah, for the, yeah, the 2A, 2A yeah. receptor, you know. And we did some interesting displacement studies showing that, you know, it would displace LSD in particular. You know, if you had labeled LSD, you could use DOI to block it or vice versa. Showed, you know that these were common, the same receptors, which we now, you know, at the time, this was a kind of a discovery. Now, of course, it's trivial, of course, that's what was going on. But it was a great experience for me. Real pharmacology. Real pharmacology, right, instead of ethnopharmacology. No, no, no. no. <laughs> but, you know, you have to have both, right, because it's ethnopharmacology that points the way to real pharmacology, you know, and as I think we talked about before, about salvia dominorum is a good example, you know, salvinorin A mm. emerges as just the most, most potent and most selective kappa opiate agonist ever discovered in or out of nature. Yes. So saying something. <laughs> I cite this all the time as, you know, the triumph of ethnopharmacology because, you know, uh, Brian Roth, who I'm sure you know, did a lot of structure activity work on Salvadora. And he told me once, he said, if I set out to design kappa opiate selective agonist, it would not look like Salvadoran A. <laughs> he said, you know, that stuff looks like cholesterol. And yet there it is, you know, it's the most selective, most potent. So you never know what you're going to find in nature. No, and I'm sure there's a lot out there. This Italian lady might, uh, might well come up with some other interesting things. But when you think of I the think so. species are disappearing, yeah. this, you know, we really ought to be accelerating our analysis of what's out there. Because you say, we, we, you know, well, we're losing a species a day or something, aren't we? I mean, it's, it's terrifying the, uh, the loss of biodiversity we have at present that's killing 
Yeah, it, it is a shame. And we've got two people from ICERS. You're familiar with ICERS? Dennis, I am, but not all the listeners will be. Well, the ICERS is the International Center for Ethnobotanical Education Research and Service, ICERS.org. And they do wonderful work. They're based in Spain. And they basically kind of adopted two of these sacred plants, particularly Iboga and Ayahuasca. And they are trying to foster the slow down the disappearance of these things, take some of the pressure away, protect these plants, protect people's right to use them at the same time. And so they're going to make a presentation about not exactly biopiracy, you know, but the ayahuasca tourism thing and also the boga tourism thing to a lesser extent really puts pressure on these plants. And so and they're going to talk about that, you know, that basically these plants are being killed because people love them too much. I think that's the theme of their talk. And, you know, we have to be responsible as members of the scientific community that want to preserve these traditions, preserve this genetics. We have to be careful about how we use them, you know, and how much we use them. And, and we have to in order to do that, we have to form alliances with indigenous communities. We have to work with them, you know, to protect their knowledge and protect their habitats because their habitats are also where the people live is where, and develop, uh, you know, cultivation protocols. So we're not harvesting wild. And that's all about, that's what the McKenna Academy is all about. That's kind of our central mission is to uh, preserve and protect this traditional knowledge and bridge it to scientific knowledge, you know, and make, make that connection. So we have this other project that we're working on, which we'll talk about at the conference. And we're actually doing a documentary series about uh, Amazonian traditional medicine, and we'll be releasing the first one at the conference and kind of kick that off at the conference. So oh, uh, Colleen, that's, yeah, so it's going to be exciting. <laughs> so a couple of things to say, and it's, and it's hybrid. So there are, there will be people attending, but again, you're going to stream given the success of streaming last time, it, it would be, you know, people would be desperate if you didn't. So how can people access then? Is it, is there a website now? We don't have information up there right now but we will if in about a week and it will be easy to remember it'll be espd55.com that's where the website will be people will be able to sign up and register for the live stream and then we have in-person guests such as yourself are you going to be able to stay with us the whole time or are you going to go back home no, I can't do the whole time, but I would definitely give you a couple of nights in a whole day. Great. That's I'm answering for the Monday. Yes. Right. But unfortunately, I have a I have another bloody employer called Imperial College. You know, there are things I <laughs> I have to do teaching and stuff as well. Yeah. I can't just explore the wonders of uh, of ethnopharmacology. Right. As... We understand. We understand. But we appreciate your making time, and I think think people will will enjoy this if our viewership is anything like it was last time when we had 75,000 people that was five years ago when nobody cared so hopefully we're shooting for twice that number I mean that was remarkable I have to say because that was pre-COVID and people didn't know how to use computers and videos then yeah maybe yeah. you'll double that well, that's exactly right so people do people are used to this now but, you know, in the spirit of the first one, we wanted to do a physical conference. And I hope that COVID cooperates. And, you know, it seems like it's coming back up in the UK, but we're hoping for the best. Well, the good news, if you come over and get it, you'll just have to stay longer, won't you? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So, Dr. Nutt, you're going to be talking about the policy but you're also going to discuss some of the work that you've been doing. So you've got a split presentation. You would like to tell us about some of that? 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm. I just wanted to share with you something that's really quite remarkable and un- so again slightly unexpected that we've come up with, which uh, will be published um, uh, fairly soon. Um, it's in Nature Medicine, and it's it's exploring the connectivity of the brain before and after psilocybin, which goes up and it goes up during, but it goes up after. So there's this rather prolonged phenomenon of increased connectivity, which amazingly correlates with um, clinical outcome. And this is a permanent change or a long-lasting change? Well, it certainly lasts three weeks, which is during the, as long as we've managed to, we've managed to do the recordings for the depressed people, but uh, yeah. So as long as you take psilocybin there for three weeks, you can keep yourself stoked up, as it were. <laughs> well, that in itself is a very interesting hypothesis, and I think it would be a great study to do. I mean, it, it won't be easy to get funding for it, but it would, I mean, the, the, it does, but you raise a really fundamental point, and I think that's one of the issues that we all need to talk about, is that when we're using these medicines for mental health problems, which tend to recur, you know, how can we, how can we best use them? You know, one of the the really exciting things about psilocybin for depression was that it did seem to reset the brain and people did seem to get better and stay better. And some people from our first trial, they're well eight years on, but for the majority, the depression sort of fights its way back. It's almost like right. it's in the brain and it's, you know, it's coming, it suppress it and then it comes back. So the question is how, if you kept suppressing it, would it go, would it be like cancer? If you could keep knocking it down, would it eventually disappear? Or is it like a habit that's there and you have to just kind of push it and you will always come back, but you might have to just do regular therapies. And then that raises two other really interesting questions. Um, one is, you know, would pulse therapy, as you just intimated, would pulse therapy with psilocybin would be the right way or would, or would maybe microdosing? I was going to ask you about that. What, what do you think about microdosing? Do you think that's an effective approach to keeping, the, keeping these connectivities I'd love to see it studied. I mean, I think if microdosing, it's likely that the most the most probable effect of microdosing would be to maintain wellness rather than to produce it, if you see what I mean, rather than whether microdosing has got enough oomph to get people out of a depression, I'm not sure. But it may well be that when you're out, it, it, you can use it to keep yourself well. And, and I'd love to see that study done. And what it needs, it absolutely needs to be done because uh, so many people are using microdosing and it's would we just be great to know one way or the other yeah there needs to be a well-controlled study i'm totally with you on that there are anecdotal studies there's you know online surveys and all of this kind of thing but there is not a well-controlled study of microdosing and i think that's important I i think because it is very popular and you know a number of companies i mean there's multi-million dollar companies startup companies are basing everything on microdosing you know and the assumption is well of course it works well as a scientist i guess i count myself as one i'd like to see where's the evidence and where's good evidence solid evidence and it, it makes sense that it could work but you know that's not data you need data no no and the big problem is, you know, the legal status, because many years ago, it must be four, at least four, we had ethical permission to do an LSD microdosing study, but the hospital said, well, it's a schedule one drug. You've got to can only give even a microdose, even a, you know, a, even a, in the case of LSD, it was a microdose. It was like a one <laughs> microgram dose. Oh no, you've got to give it in hospital because it's an illegal drug. And, and it was just too expensive. We couldn't afford to rent all that space. So, uh, this is one area where actually that kind of private investment might give enough leverage, enough you know, money to for someone to be able to really do the study. So, I am uh, I'm hopeful someone will. Yeah, yeah. There needs to be a good study, and the private sector should fund it because they're the ones that want to profit off this. Then, of course, you know, if they're I don't know if they're evolved, shall we say, they would share those and from that those results with the world but companies being companies they like to keep their their secrets you know so so we'll see well i mean you know, it's quite complicated dennis and i'm touching this in my talk at your conference but i mean the, you do then you get into an interesting conundrum for companies because given that mushrooms are pretty easy to get you know i mean a lot of people would prefer a dried mushroom to a pill 
as hard as I've been pilled. So then, you know, you've got that side of the coin. And then you've also got this, and this is perhaps the bigger objection, you've got, you've got the problem of, of go, getting something like that, a prophylactic. Assuming I'm right, I'm assuming it protects you, but doesn't cure you, then you've got to get that. So a preventative medicine through a regulator, that's not easy to do. And you look at the, you know, if you're looking at things like, been used in the past, like lithium in that to keep people well, well, it's turned out, you know, that regulators can make you jump through a lot of hoops. You know, it may be very challenging to prove, you know, what to a regulatory standard, what might actually turn out to be relatively clear from a scientific standard. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of water to go under the bridge yet, I can tell you. Yeah. Well, it's always hard to go from the clinic to actual use. You know, you can do studies, but then it's the legal hoops that are the disincentive for this. But even in that, on that level, I, I guess you're going to talk to us a bit about changes in policy over the last few years with regard to international regulation of psychedelics, particularly. Is there anything to be encouraged about or is it the same old? Well, no, I mean, the, the real encouragement is Oregon, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if you, you guys were involved in that, but but I mean, that, that, that is a seismic change. What is, which? Oregon, the Oregon. Oh, Oregon, yeah. No, we're not really involved in it. We are looking at it, you know, favorably and kind of that is the test case. It'll be interesting to see where, where that goes, you know. And I'm encouraged by that, you know, because I think for one thing, it opens the door to using the natural medicines. And I think that most people, probably would prefer to use mushrooms than psilocybin and using psilocybin isn't an option for a lot of people i think many people would prefer mushrooms and it also opens the the possibility to kind of integrate some of these traditional ceremonial practices you know whether whether tailored for you know a modern demographic it almost has to be but you know, the importance of set and setting, we all know how important that is. And people that have been doing this shamanic medicine for centuries, they've learned a thing or two about set and setting, you know. And so totally. I think that's where the the could, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's exciting times in terms of seeing, you know, these things that have been marginalized for so long beginning to be accepted reluctantly, but it's the trend of the times, I guess. It is. It is good, actually. I mean, I, you know, when you I say, when we look back to the 80s and we were just beginning to scratch at the level of the receptors and not really understand. I mean, yeah, it, it's been transformational. Those 40 years have been transformational and in a very positive sense. And what's really like working in the serotonin field is it's, it seems to be a good neurotransmitter because on the other side of the coin, of course, is dopamine, which people thought was, you know, the get up and go and the drive. But in the end, dopamine tends to cause problems if you push that system too much, whereas it tends to be where serotonin tends to heal you. And I, I kind of, I become very pro serotonin as I got older. <laughs> well, I don't think of it that way, but yeah, serotonin is a pretty remarkable chemical and that's, ties into a lot of the questions about consciousness and you know just from a pure standpoint of neuroscience i, th I think the psychedelics are the greatest tool we've had to study the nature of consciousness you know because you could really explore the limits of consciousness and you know as a scientist you know that if you want to understand the system how something works you disturb it, you know, Absolutely. you destabilize it and then you say, what's go wrong? So this gives you a way that you can, under very controlled uh, circumstances, you, you can temporarily disable this default mode network and then interesting things happen. Well, I absolutely agree with you, Dennis. I can't see how you can really say you study consciousness without using psychedelics, but there are, there's still people that need convincing. They're called anesthetists. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, anesthetists, yes, they can ac abolish consciousness. They certainly know how to do that, and, and that tells us something. That tells exactly. But as far as a tool for looking into 
kind of the, the parameters of consciousness of what that can encompass. You know, Robin Carhart Harris talks about the default mode network, but for years I was talking about the reality hallucination, which is essentially <laughs> the same thing, you know, this artificial world that we create for ourselves, this reality that we inhabit as a result of processing external data, but then, you know, we're not living in the real world, we're living in a model reality, and we can disable that, and then we can kind of look behind the curtain and say, what's what's going on, you know, beyond this artificial reality, which is very convenient in most cases, you know, it's, a... <laughs> yeah. But it can go wrong, and that's the point, isn't it? Is it this uh, mind-created reality? If it, if it distorts, then you know, and people end up with depression or addiction or you know other other mental health disorders. So no, it's in fact that is I think one of the most thrilling insights we've gained from psychedelics is we've actually proven the theory, which you just expounded. You know that, that reality is an illusion. I mean, you know, psychedelics prove that because they take away the ability to maintain the illusion. And so, you know, you know, therefore, it was an illusion. It, it kind of it proves what neurophysiologists have been kind of postulating, but never really were able to actually demonstrate in humans. So that's one of the great advances of, what, of the field, I think. Right. And I think that that's where you find the therapeutic utility of psychedelics, the fact that they let you step out of this reference frame temporarily, you know, and look at your situation from different perspective whether it's addiction or depression or whatever and then when that default mode network reestablishes itself which it will do everything tends toward equilibrium right but when it falls back together it's literally like rebooting your computer you know it runs better for a while i think it's a very similar analogy you know it is and it's fascinating how patients use that analogy mm -hmm. They really do. They talk about rebooting or reformatting the hard drive or, or just defragging. And it, it is, it's, uh, and they find it, you know, it's just so intuitively right. You know, things were running wrong. They don't know why they're running wrong, but very often, you know, I mean, they don't want them to be running wrong. It's not as if they enjoy these horrible ruminations or addictions. They can't stop it. And suddenly clarity comes and they can, wow, feel different. And it's just so, you know, empowering for some of them. It's just so, th and it's thrilling for us as, you know, therapists to see them transformed in a, in a very positive way yeah and i think serotonin's probably at the center of that you know it's like this big serotonin reset yes you know and then things work more smoothly and sometimes for months or years other people have to return to the well once in a while and drink from the well and get boosted but that's okay you know they should have that option and yeah so one of the thing, there's a paper that um, Robin Connor Harris has been leading on, and I've been helping him with, trying to make sense of why there are so many of these 5-HT2A receptors in the cortex. I mean, and I think you you'll find, you'll find, you know, that's you've probably thought about that yourself, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have wondered. Yes, yeah. When I did my work at NIH mapping these 5-HT2 receptors. One finding that one of my, if my work had any significance, and I don't think it really, I mean, you know, as science, it wasn't, you know, nobody's calling me from Stockholm for sure. But one of the uh, findings that we showed was that the claustrum had the highest density of these 5-HT2A receptors as anywhere in the brain. And at the time, nobody knew what the claustrum was. It was, you know, and that's where it was, you know, and there was speculation that it was some kind of a information switching yeah. point. What can you tell me about the claustrum? A lot more has been learned about it since. Well, I'm not sure much has been learned. I, I, oh, it's quite <laughs> okay. But yes, but it's got a lot of the kappa receptors as well. I mean, it's clearly, I think it is probably a gate. It's probably a gateway between subcortical and cortical, or sort of some kind of parallel Maybe a gain, maybe a gain system rather than the gateway to the cortex. I suspect that has some kind of. Hmm, that's interesting. And it's also thick with kappa opiate receptors, you say? It is, yeah. That's really densely populated with kappa opiate receptors. That's very interesting. Wow. But that's probably where the bad things happen, and, the, and then the serotonin receptors are where the good things happen. Right, right. Well, 
certainly the experience of Salvadoran, which is uh, for me personally, is very limited because it's very uh, dysphoric. It's not pleasant at all. And it's just bizarre, you know, it's just extremely bizarre. But again, it's like, you know, I mean, some people actually like this. I guess they have funny tastes. But the fact that you have these probes, you know, like Salvador and A, and it's so selective, that could tell you a lot about, you know, the interface between consciousness and, and neuroscience. And so it's very fascinating. I'm mostly focusing on, you know, I mean, I'm just an ethnopharmacologist, not a neuroscience. My tour into neuroscience was brief, but very interest, very rewarding in some ways. Well, we're glad you did it, Dennis, and I'm really glad to have had you on the program again. And I'm really looking forward to the conference this uh, happening in May this year, the ESPD 55. ESPD55.com. It should com. be up should be up in well within a week it just should be something up there our people are working assiduously to get it up there so keep your eye out for that and people can sign up and watch it from anywhere in the world right yes it'll be live streamed don't ask me the details but it'll all be on the website probably facebook or one of these live streaming platforms maybe more than one even. But yes, people should be able to see it anywhere in the world and it'll all be recorded. So people, you know, you don't have to get up at three in the morning to watch these things. It'll all be there and accessible forever. Great. What a legacy, Dennis. Thank you so much for, for A, doing this, organizing the conference, the second and also for doing the podcast. And I, I really look forward to Dinner with you on the Sunday night, all right? I shall be there. <laughs> all right. Very good, Dr. Nutt. We're looking forward to it. It's going to be... You can call me Dave now. I don't think you've got to stop calling me Dr. Nutt. <laughs> all right, Dave. Okay, Dave. We'll see you at the conference. And, uh, yeah. Look forward to it. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Great to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank you.